Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started this morning with those growing fears that the war between Israel and Hamas is spilling over to other parts of the Middle East. In Iran, at least 84 people were killed yesterday in two explosions at a memorial for a top Iranian general. More than 210 people were injured. No one has claimed responsibility for the attack. And fighting is intensifying around Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Hezbollah announced nine of its fighters were killed yesterday, marking one of the deadliest days for the group since October. Just one day earlier, a senior Hamas leader was killed in a strike in Beirut. Israel has not confirmed whether it was behind that blast. As fighting escalates between Israel and Iran-backed militant groups, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is heading to the Middle East to lead a new round of crisis diplomacy. It is his fourth trip since the war began. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Tel Aviv with the latest. Raf, good morning. So the fighting between Israel and Iran-backed Hezbollah is escalating. The IDF says it hit Hezbollah fighters yesterday in Lebanon, killing nine there. What more should we know about that? Joe, good morning. You should know that Israel's military says they are at peak readiness along the Lebanese border. As you said, nine Hezbollah fighters killed yesterday, one of the bloodiest days for that group since October 7th, with this tit for tat fighting across the border. And in just the last hour, the Israeli military says more rockets fired from Lebanon into northern Israel. The military saying they have responded with mortar fire and with airstrikes. And the question, Joe, at this point is, at what scale will Hezbollah, that powerful Lebanese Shia militant group backed by Iran, respond to the assassination in Beirut? The leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, has said that any Israeli attacks in Beirut itself, in the Lebanese capital, would be a red line for Hezbollah. They say that this assassination will not go unpunished. But at the same time, it's not clear that Hezbollah wants to do anything which would trigger a full-scale war with Israel. Remember, Lebanon is mired in deep economic crisis. People are desperate inside the country. And Hezbollah doesn't want to be seen to be dragging the country into a full-scale war. But a lot of concern across the region and in the United States that even if both sides don't want a war, there could be a miscalculation that could lead to one. Guys. Raph, let's talk about the connection here with the U.S. According to two U.S. officials, we're learning that Israel did not tell the U.S. in advance about this strike in Lebanon. We're told Israel told Washington about the strike as it was happening. We should note, though, Israel hasn't officially taken responsibility. Is there any indication whether this is creating any further tension between Israel and the U.S., this particular event? Yeah, it's a good question. So on the one hand, we haven't seen the U.S. condemn this strike. The U.S. has been openly supportive of Israel's campaign against Hamas, against the leaders who they say were responsible for the October 7th terror attack. On the other hand, the U.S. does not want to see the war in Gaza expanding across the region, doesn't want to see it expanding into Lebanon. And this is exactly the kind of strike that could lead to escalation. Uh, a senior U.S. official, his name is Amos Hochstein, is here in Israel today. He's sort of President Biden's troubleshooter when it comes to issues between Israel and Lebanon. An Israeli official tells me he is going to be meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu later on today to see what can be done to defuse the tensions. But as you said, this is all coming ahead of Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to the region, and it comes in the aftermath of those explosions in Iran. Guys. Right. Raf, thank you so much for your reporting. We want to bring in NBC News Tehran Bureau Chief Ali Aruzi, who is in Tehran. Ali, let's talk about those explosions in Iran. What is the latest there this morning? Hey, Joe. So the attack in Kerman in southern Iran has killed at least 84 people and wounded scores more. They're saying over 210 people. Amongst the dead and injured are also women and children, and they all seem uh, to be uh, civilians. <clears throat> the death toll was revised down this morning by the head of Iran's emergency services from an earlier figure of uh, 103 and then 95. <clears throat> Nonetheless, Joe, this still marks the deadliest terror attack in Iran since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Now, as of yet, no group has uh, claimed responsibility for the attack, but Iranian officials have been very quick to point the finger at Israel. A senior member of parliament said that the attack bears all the hallmarks of a Mossad operation. Iran's president, Ebrahim Raisi, blamed Israel and the U.S., 
but the U.S. said it has no indication that Israel was involved and dismissed any suggestion uh, that Washington may have been behind these attacks as well. But it's also important to note, uh, in the past, Joe, Israel's hallmark is the targeted assassination of key military and scientific figures inside of Iran, as opposed to mass casualty attacks like the one we saw yesterday. Yeah. But it's also important to point out that Israel has said that the rules of engagement have changed in response to the Hamas killings on October 7th. Uh, and we all know that Israel uh, ultimately holds Iran responsible. Um, also, from early this morning, billboards have sprung up across the city vowing revenge for these attacks. But more often than not, these public displays of revenge from Tehran tend to be bluster. Joe? Ali, what's the significance of this attack happening at this memorial for that top Iranian general? Hey, Savannah. Well, I mean, this is the latest in a long string of uh, security embarrassments and breaches uh, for Iran. I mean, over the last few weeks, we've seen senior Iranian generals being uh, taken out in Syria. We've seen uh, al-Aruri, who is a very important conduit with Hamas and Iran, being taken out in Beirut. And then yesterday, the day the, the most revered general who was assassinated by the U.S. in 2020, arguably the most powerful man in Iran after Khamenei, you know, they're ha having a huge ceremony for him. And then the biggest terrorist attack happens in the country. So it's, a, it's very embarrassing for them. It shows that uh, they can't secure uh, their people or their top military uh, figures. Uh, and that's why you're seeing them up in arms right now talking about revenge. And this won't go, you know, unsettled and blaming the U.S. and, and Israel. But uh, the reality is Iran is probably not going to get involved directly itself. The price will be too high for them. And we'll probably see an uptick in attacks by proxies in the Levant or the Red Sea. But uh, beyond that, it's unlikely that there's going to be some massive escalation and retribution from Iran. Savannah? All right. Ali Aruzi, as always, thank you so much for your reporting. Thanks, Ali. Well, Hagar Shamali joins us now for a closer look at what's at stake here. She's the host of Oh My World on YouTube, a former spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N. and former NSC director for Syria and Lebanon. Hagar, always great to have you with us. So what do you make of all this, specifically these two events, this blast we saw, these twin blasts in Iran and the killing of this Hamas leader in Lebanon? Are we closer to the brink of a regional war? No. You know, one of the things that I always say in the Middle East is that when the storms gather in the Middle East, it storms everywhere. Sorry, when the clouds gather in the Middle East, it storms everywhere. And the reason for that is that when you've got instability, then you have these proxy groups, these Iran-backed militant groups and other terrorist organizations take advantage of that instability to provoke trouble, um, to try and push U.S. presence out, to try and, and, and cause massive fatalities. And that was the first thing I thought when I saw the blast that happened in Iran yesterday. My first thought was that this has all the markings of an ISIS attack. And the reason is because... ISIS, when it pursued, first of all, ISIS has pursued num a number of attacks in Iran before. Uh, when they're pursuing something, when talking about targeting a mass group of civilians, a gathering of civilians like that, uh, who were who were there commemorating the the death of a former IRGC general Qasem Soleimani, that. That's something that ISIS would do. That is the same typical attack they pursue in Afghanistan, where when they have a wedding or a funeral or some kind of gathering of civilians, they do a terrorist attack. It doesn't at all have the markings of a state actor, or certainly not Israel, which would pursue, if they're going to pursue something in Iran, it would be against a, an expert of some kind, an official, a, a somebody that poses a direct threat to them, not a group of civilians in this way. And so that's the first thing I would say there. On Beirut, Oh, this was a specific targeted counterterrorism operation to target and kill a Hamas leader, a top Hamas leader, who poses an active threat to Israel. And by the way, to the United States, he poses a massive threat to the national security interests of the United States and to the region in general. But it wasn't a message against Lebanon or a it meant to be some kind of strike that targeted Beirut more broadly. It was specific to him. That doesn't mean Hezbollah is not going to respond. It will likely respond. And Israel's bracing itself for that, for sure. But I still don't think that either of these events, all these events you're seeing, I don't see them sparking a wide 
full-scale war unless a massive miscalculation happens, which could always happen when you're talking about the Middle East. So, Hagar, no one has claimed responsibility for the attack inside Iran, but it was somewhat sophisticated. You had a smaller blast meant to attract first responders, then a larger blast. Iran thinks Israel is behind it. Israel has not said it was. Is there anyone else who could be trying to send a message to Iran? Not really. I mean, not not with an attack like that. It really does have the markings of a terrorist organization. Um, and it, it, while it might seem sophisticated in how they there was a decoy, if you will, that is also a very classic move by terrorist organizations, where they do something first, they bring first responders, so then they can attar they can blow up everyone because the number one goal there is to maximize fatalities and casualties. Now. I, of course, I'm going on here and I'm telling you it's ISIS and I'm speculating and I want to be clear about that. But the fact that Iran itself, the Iranian government, hasn't said, oh, we know for sure that it's Israel um, and that you've seen nobody comment on who it might be is because they don't know and because it is likely a terrorist organization. But in terms of a message to Iran, what you're seeing, and Al Ali had this right, uh, Iran knows not to provoke the United States in a war. You're going to, to see limited strikes by proxy groups and proportional responses in return. All right. Hagar Shamali, as always, thanks so much for joining us. Well, in Israel, a somewhat unexpected group is being brought into the fight. Some seminary students are training to go to war. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman has the story. From morning until evening, they study Torah at Yeshiva Chesder Yerucham in Israel's Negev Desert, pausing in the afternoon to pray, including for Israeli troops fighting in Gaza. At this seminary for young men, eight students have already been killed in the Israel-Hamas war. How is this yeshiva dealing with such profound loss? We're, we're never ready for something like this to happen. The vast majority of ultra-Orthodox Jews do not serve in the IDF, but many modern Orthodox do. And at this yeshiva, 95% of students are drafted into combat units. Judaism is a religion that believes in life, but we also uh, know that sometimes we have to pay the ultimate price for um, uh, our people, uh, our nation. A student now in the IDF comes for a visit, treated like a hero by friends like Yehuda Korn, who is 19. In a few months, he'll be drafted too. It is my duty and obligation as a observant Jew. Yehuda shows the empty seat next to his in the yeshiva study hall, where 19-year-old Ariel Yahu once sat. On October 7th, Ariel was in a tank near Gaza hit by a missile at the start of a war that has been devastating for Palestinians and Israelis. Does this make you feel like you could be next? Try not to think about that, because uh, I could be, but, um, but it, it motivates me more. In Mitzbe Yericho, a settlement in the occupied West Bank, Ariel's father, a rabbi, says his family sees serving in Israel's military as a religious duty. So for us, this is the way to live the, re the real religious life. He says he saw an awakening in his son as he served his nation. All the special things that he had inside flourish in a beautiful way. And this is how we will remember him. If you ask me if I would uh, do it again, I, yeah, I would send him again. Um, because this is our land and yeah, this is what we have to do. Josh Letterman, NBC News, Yerucham, Israel. This morning, we are getting a look at the first batch of unsealed court documents related to the case of convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. The highly anticipated trove of about 900 pages includes references to familiar names from politicians to celebrities, many of them previously linked to Epstein before his suicide in 2019. Former presidents Bill Clinton and Donald Trump were mentioned in depositions, although neither contained allegations of wrongdoing. NBC News legal analyst, former prosecutor Kristen gibbons Fedden joins us now to talk more about this. Kristen, good to have you with us. So first of all, just remind us what these documents actually are, why they're starting to be unsealed now. These are all court documents, so excerpts from testimony that was attached to any of the court filings. And the only reason these documents really didn't come out sooner is because initially back in 2017, there was a motion to unseal them. And it all stems from the 2015 um, lawsuit with Virginia Joffrey versus Maxwell, who was the associate and convicted 
of, you know, aiding and abetting the sex trafficking with Epstein. But the reason it really didn't come out sooner is because there was a lot of pushback from some of the individuals that were named in these lawsuits, um, basically saying, hey, it's, I'm going to lose my reputation or they'd be embarrassed. But essentially what has happened through the appellate process and what has now come back down is that the courts have deemed that transparency is important with regard to the judicial process. And so the Miami Herald's motion, which was initially denied, was reversed and remanded. And that's where Judge Prescott is now ordering the release of these court documents, which is what is these documents that we're seeing. So this first batch that we just got, what stands out to you in them? So a lot of it was really already known, um, and that goes back to that judicial weighing of the interests of what should be kept secret and what should be revealed to the public through this judicial process. But I think one of the things that really stands out to me was that May 2016 deposition testimony from Joanna Joburg, which was one of Epstein's alleged victims, where she made these notable revelations about what Epstein once mentioned that Bill Clinton, he likes them young, referring to the girls. And the, also there was an incident where she flew with Epstein and they stopped in New Jersey and he basically mentioned Trump and that he would stay at Trump's casino. And then the third thing was that Prince Andrews had inappropriately um, touched her. But again, as you mentioned earlier in this segment, these are all juxtaposed with statements that these high-profile individuals were not aware of the wrongdoing and that they did not engage in this wrongdoing. But nevertheless, these revelations are important. Yeah, and I want to kind of recap here. President Clinton referring back to a statement in 2019 saying he knew nothing about the terrible crimes of Jeffrey Epstein, as you mentioned, not accused of wrongdoing. Trump saying he had a falling out with him a long time ago, not a fan of his, he said in the past, again, not accused of any wrongdoing. And Prince Andrew previously a strongly denied allegations, said he had no recollection of ever having met Jew Free. Now, some of the names in the documents are still redacted. Why yeah. is that? Could the judge decide to reveal them going forward? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But again, the judge is going to be constantly weighing that balance between the public's right to access judicial documents and the limited privacy rights of those individuals who are still seeking confidentiality or keeping their name private from the public. And a lot of them, um, the, the two main ones, are the, are the victims, right? And so a lot of the redactions um, relate to minors or even the victims or even survivors really not wanting to come forward because they hadn't come forward in the past. Do you anticipate that these releases could have any possible legal implications for any individuals, for certain individuals, maybe as more documents are released, if more names are released? Sure. I, I really do think there's always legal implications whenever circumstantial evidence connecting powerful individuals to a criminal ep uh, enterprise like Epstein's is involved. You know, it's not just about what the papers say. It's really about the doors that they really open. You know, sex abuse can really involve repression with survivors dealing with trauma in their own time. So this is, you know, what has really led to revival windows and legislation around the country extending the statute of limitations. So we may see a little bit more of that within the society. Um, but again, you know, this could also lead to new investigations, new criminal indictments, like we saw uh, with R. Kelly, you know, prosecuting various offenses that individually would have been barred by the statute of limitations. We also saw this in the aftermath of the Constant v. Cosby defamation case where Cosby's um, deposition was released. And, you know, that ultimately led um, or was partially responsible for his criminal prosecution, which I was involved in. So I think the important thing is these revelations could involve le the legal world moving forward as a whole. All right, Kristen, appreciate your analysis this mm -hmm. morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Now let's get to the race for the White House, where former President Trump has asked the Supreme Court to overturn a Colorado ruling last month that deemed him ineligible for the state's GOP primary ballot. The ruling cites the 14th Amendment's insurrection ban and Trump's actions on January 6th at the U.S. Capitol. Trump's attorneys say the court should, quote, return the right to vote for their candidate of choice to the voters. Colorado's primary set for March 5th which is Super Tuesday. NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard joins us now from Des Moines, Iowa, with the latest developments. Von, good morning. Of course, Des Moines, we're about to see the first contest, really, of this in just a few days here. So we know Trump will remain on the Colorado primary ballot for now, pending the Supreme Court's ruling on this. The Colorado Republican Party already filed its own appeal. But what more can you tell us about what we get from Trump's appeal so far? 
Right. In Trump team's appeal here, they write in their filing that only Congress should be able to determine whether an individual is on the ballot or not and can be removed under the 14th Amendment, the Disqualification Clause, Section 3. The second argument that they make here is that Donald Trump, even if the court were to find that he is eligible and was an officer of the United States, and that the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment could apply to him, that on the merits of whether he engaged in insurrection, he did not. And so they lay out multiple arguments with the hope that the U.S. Supreme Court will side with them, at least on one of them. Of course, there is no timeline for the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to take up this appeal if they so choose to do so. Of course, though, if they were to take it up and affirm the Colorado Supreme Court's decision, it would have far-reaching impacts slightly far beyond Colorado. So, Ivan, it was just last week when the state of Maine, an elected official there, a Democrat, ruled Trump ineligible for the primary ballot there, citing the 14th Amendment. Explain to us the ripple effect this could potentially have if the Supreme Court does rule in favor of states that are essentially crossing Trump's name off the ballot. That's exactly right, Joe. That's why I suggested that if they were to rule on this Colorado case, it would likely impact states well beyond Colorado, and that could potentially include Maine as well, because there is right now a patchwork of decisions around the country that are being determined by state courts. And in the case of Maine, the Secretary of State herself said under Maine state law, again, state laws are different when it applies to elections from state to state. And Maine, the Secretary of State said it was her duty to determine whether Donald Trump was qualified under the 14th Amendment and whether he had engaged in insurrection. And she made the determination that he had. And so she made uh, the decision to remove him from the ballot. Now, that decision was appealed by Trump's legal team as well. We expect the Superior Court in the state to make a ruling uh, by January 17th there. But again, this is where the U.S. Supreme Court is undoubtedly watching these lawsuits in other states. More than a dozen state courts are working through their own separate lawsuits. And so the U.S. Supreme Court is watching this closely. And if they were to make a, a ruling uh, on either the Colorado case or the Maine case, uh, the ramifications would more than likely be far reaching, not just uh, 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 decisive in those individual mm. states. Savannah, of course, we find you in Des Moines because the Iowa caucus is less than two weeks away. Trump has maintained a large lead in the polls there for months now. Any, implica any indication that these legal challenges are having any impact on his campaign? Right. The, the legal is running very perpendicular to the political right now. We're just 11 days away from the Iowa caucus here. And right now, number one, polling does not suggest that the uh, number one, that the 14th Amendment disputes or also the four pending criminal trials against him are having uh, any major impact on him. You see there in Iowa, he's got a more than 30 point lead right now. And anecdotally, guys, I'm not seeing the surge of support around any of these alternative candidates. I was at a Ron DeSantis event yesterday just down the road from here, and there was about a crowd of 60 in this Des Moines suburb. And for Nikki Haley as well, she was holding a rally in New Hampshire yesterday, and uh, Chris Sununu, the governor of New Hampshire who endorsed her, outright said that they expect Donald Trump to win the state of Iowa, and Nikki Haley said that she's looking to correct the course that Iowa makes by pulling off a win in New Hampshire. So uh, right now, this first caucus state here uh, could uh, send a clear signal of, uh, uh, about the direction of this Republican primary ahead. Certainly can. I'm sure we'll be talking to you a lot from there over the next 11 days. Vaughn, thank you so much. All right, we have a big coast-to-coast -coast storm brewing. Exciting some folks. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Only if it brings snow. Andrew Lastman, <laughs> track it for us. Good morning. It's going to bring snow somewhere, <laughs> guys. Good morning to you. We do have that big coast-to-coast -coast storm that we're going to be watching not just today and not just tomorrow, but well into the weekend as well for, yes, the potential impacts uh, hugging the East Coast. We'll get to that in a moment, but here's what we're dealing with right now. Some snow falling in those higher elevations of parts of the Southwest. We've got the system working out of portions of Arizona and into New Mexico. The central and southern Rockies are where we'll see snow through the day today. And we've got the winter alerts to prove it. They are stretching still in places like California, but all the way out into parts of the plains as well. Those are going to go through Sunday in a lot of these spots. Here's the deal as far as the system movement. We're going to see it work a little farther to the east through the day today. And by this afternoon, we could see some additional rain, some showers, some thunderstorm activity across parts of the southern plains. There's that snow I mentioned from the central and southern Rockies. As we get 
get into tomorrow, it picks up pace and it starts to really in, uh, get invigorated by some of this moisture uh, that it's tapping into from the Gulf of Mexico. That's where it starts to hug the coast right there. And you'll notice that it does bring the potential for some heavy rain. We'll watch for the flooding conditions and maybe a strong storm or two for your Friday along the Gulf Coast. We'll be watching that closely. By the time we get into Saturday, this is when it moves into the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, parts of the Great Lakes. We'll see some additional snow as well. And where that rain snow line is sets up is going to be really important for, for who sees the heaviest bands of snow falling. Here's where we end up on Sunday. We're still going to deal with the heavy snow, really windy conditions. Travel will likely be difficult on the roads and in the air for this day and in that region. Uh, and we'll also we'll see some lingering snow showers too into Sunday. But I want to show you where our scenarios kind of lay right now. Here's our forecast model track. At 60 miles, I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but it really matters with where that heaviest band sets up. Those 60 miles are going to be key. If it takes the inside track or the northern track, we should say, uh, you'll see that heavier snow a little farther to the north and west. That means it does not in er, include places like New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. for significant so snowfall. We might see a couple of flakes. You might see maybe an inch in some of those spots. Um, but if it takes that more southern track, then that's where we'll see the potential uh, for some of that snow to be a little closer to the coast. The problem with the northern track is you get all of that warmer air starting to hug the coast. So that means that the precipitation falls in the form of rain. So it's not like we're going to escape it completely. There will be some precipitation falling and interrupting your plans Saturday and Sunday, guys. Um, but whether it's the really significant snowfall for those major cities, it, it doesn't look that likely. Um, but places like Boston will likely see some, some snow. And if you're looking for <laughs> heavier snow, just... You Just know, go west. Savannah there. head west. Savannah is wondering if we can vote on which track. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if true. only we it were not the northern track. Do we track. have a voice in this? <laughs> I'll give you a voice in anything, guys. I'll do my best. Thanks, Angie. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.